Welcome to the environment. I'd like to invite you to consider the idea of being fully present as a choice rather than as a directive. And this might happen by stepping out of the cognitive thinking mind to focus on having a solely sensory experience. So we're going to start by using our eyes just to look around the room, taking in all the visual information of our surroundings. Notice the structure of the room, the colors, the space. Notice the other people in the room. See if you can invite thought to pause as we just take in the simple experience of vision. And now we're going to start to internalize our focus. And this might happen by closing your eyes or lowering your gaze. Now we're going to start to explore the room through the sensation of hearing. Listen to sounds free from labeling, like you're listening to an orchestra, not labeling each and every individual instrument. And then as you're filled up by sounds, shift your attention to physical sensations of the body. Notice the shape your body takes as you're seated in the chair. Feel the chair rise up beneath you to support your weight. Notice your clothing and its relationship to your angles and curves. Notice the physical sensation of comfort or discomfort. Now start to become aware of your experience as a whole. Start to engage the thinking mind just enough to wonder about how you feel in this moment. Are you content? Anxious? Bored? Is your mind here or is it anticipating? This is mindfulness. The process of wondering and being curious about each moment as it unfolds. And it's really just that simple. So my talk today isn't so much about how to develop skills of mindfulness. There's plenty of information out there on that. Instead, I'd like to talk about how I use mindfulness in my work as a dance movement therapist with people who experience substance addiction. So in my experience, developing a healthy relationship with a person in an addiction cycle can be a challenging one, especially given that their primary relationship is to the drug itself. And even after the drug or drink is no longer a major factor in their functioning, a person continues to struggle with impulsive behavior and emotional reactivity. Over the years, I've been working to design effective dance movement therapy and body-based mindfulness programs specifically for this population. As a dance therapist, I use the process of exploring movement to help clients develop healthier and more effective ways of communicating and socializing, which is vital since interpersonal stress appears to be the biggest trigger for most people in recovery. Fortunately, there's a lot of research being done in neuroscience that suggests that practices as simple as the one we just experienced helps a person to emotionally regulate. In fact, earlier this year, an MRI study was done at the University Hospital of Psychiatry Zurich that revealed that the more mindful the individual, the less activation required in regions of the brain associated with emotional processing. What this means is, if my brain is wired for mindfulness, I'm less likely to fall prey to tricky emotional states when stressed. And in the case of drug addiction and dependence, and when I say drug, I'm also including alcohol, poor emotional regulation is the hallmark of addiction. So you might be wondering about how I use mindfulness in my work as a therapist. Well, as a dance therapist, I always prioritize the relationship. And it's within the creation of this relationship that I informally introduce mindfulness. The process may include movement like yoga or dance, or it may just be about stillness. But it will always include the body as a source of information and experience. The goal is to develop awareness about the dual processing that happens in healthy relationships. This experience that I'm aware of you and me and the relationship, while at the same time I'm aware of what's just going on for me. The most interesting part of all this, to me anyway, is the role of my own mindful state. If I'm not authentically mindful in the relationship, 
the client's going to have a very hard time consolidating mindfulness into their experience. However, if I'm deeply dedicated to the present moment and reflecting authentically, over time, clients begin to reflect inner processes similarly and respond to our exchange in a deeper and more meaningful way. And with repetition, emotional material slowly shifts from being something triggering to being something we can both wonder about together in the relationship. And there's very little formal teaching involved in this process. Only the effort on my part to make sure that I'm present to the unfolding relationship and that I'm aware of my body, my mind, and my emotions, regardless of whether the person in front of me has been trained to be present in a similar way or not. So the question that I'm exploring with you today is, if I'm entering into a relationship with you, does my ability to be deeply present in the moment help you to be deeply present in the moment? And if so, perhaps mindfulness is less about an intervention or a technique to use in our relationships or in therapy, and more about a way of being in our relationships. So as mentioned, I am a dance movement therapist, but I came to the field with a 14-year history as a yoga therapist. And as I relay my experiences as a yoga therapist, I think it's important to note that many of my realizations and understandings about what I experienced in yoga were the result of my later training as a dance therapist. Without dance movement therapy's focus on the uniqueness of embodied and nonverbal relationships, I'm not sure I could reflect on my experiences the same way. I spent 11 years of my life living in Asia, studying Eastern philosophy and yoga in a very traditional manner, which means without any structure or clear understanding about what was going on. <laughs> and while on this quest, I spent much of my time training at a free yoga therapy clinic held in the heart of Bangalore, India. Often, I'd be required to just sit and watch the teacher dish out prescriptive yoga in a language I could barely understand. And this was how I was expected to learn. And if you've ever read anything about ancient teaching practices in India, then you'll know. This is kind of what they do. And for some, it takes years, sometimes decades, to establish trust, commitment, and rapport with the teacher. Only then were these skills or powers passed between guru and student. 5,000 years ago, during the birth of yoga and this guru-disciple relationship, the creators of this ancient practice knew nothing of dance therapy, attachment theory, or neurobiology. But they absolutely operated like they did. For years, I would return to that yoga clinic, and I learned so much more than simple movement combinations to heal a slip disc or uh, breathing exercises to reduce diabetic symptoms. Through that relationship with my guru, I learned to be more like him, to be a healer who is present, compassionate, and kind. In essence, yoga was a practice to prepare a person for spiritual enlightenment. And that enlightenment only occurred with the knowledge that all is one, which means that you and I are interconnected and not separate, while at the same time we retain our individuality. And to achieve this level of awareness, we must tame the mind, which to me meant becoming aware of inner processes and how they impact external relationships. Dr. Daniel Siegel coined the term interpersonal neurobiology in his book, The Developing Mind, in 1999. Interpersonal neurobiology studies the way the brain grows and how it is influenced by personal relationships. He talks a lot about how the mind is a product of activity from the brain, but that it's also a product of our relationships with each other. When we enter into a relationship, we share a mind. In this very moment, 
we are sharing a mind. And when I walked you through that mindfulness activity at the start of my talk, we were sharing mindfulness. So to consider my earlier question, does my ability to be deeply present in the moment help you to be deeply present in the moment? If ancient Eastern thought and Dr. Siegel are right, then the answer is yes. So a client of mine with a 40-year history of drug dependence offered to share his experience of how our therapeutic relationship was influenced by this combination of movement and mindfulness. He said, the establishment of trust is at the core of my being able to listen to the wisdom of my body, especially in the newborn days when I made my first decisive moves into the uncharted territory of life without intoxicants. And that by observing you and letting your energy wash over me when we did that first movement and mindfulness piece in our old group, I experienced trust, not only in you as a witness and mirror, but also within myself. I remember an inner muttering, hmm, this is different than anything else. There may be genuine hope here. So bringing mindfulness into a relationship with a person in substance abuse recovery or in an addiction cycle means that perhaps it's our job to be mindful, to be the healthy mind that offers safety in the process of reflection and teaches simply by sharing space. I think substance abuse recovery would look a lot different if treatment providers, family, and friends offered those who are suffering a chance to be present and to be curious as a way of being rather than as a method. And so all of this kind of reminds me of an old adage often attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, but which I later learned was just a paraphrase of his original quote. Be the change you want to see in the world. Because maybe that's all it takes. And so I'd like to end my talk with an actual Mahatma Gandhi quote. I honor the place within you where the entire universe resides. I honor the place within you of love, of light, of truth, of peace. I honor the place within you where when you are in that place in you and I am in that place in me, there is only one of us. Namaste.